Welcome back to the Bookends YouTube channel. I'm James McGowan. I'm Jessica Fast. And if you watch the channel, then you definitely know our third face here. It's Tracy Marchini. <laughs> Tracy has been on the channel uh, quite a bit, right? You were actually our first ever video on the channel. Yeah, I was. And what I learned from that is I need to clean up my shot better beforehand <laughs> because <laughs> when I watched it later, I was like, ah, you could see more mess than I thought. Oh, uh, our early videos are... They were, they were, they not were rough. <laughs> I was actually looking through some of them the other day and I was like, oof, <laughs> this was just not good. Well, you know, I, you just, I think we were just trying it out and playing with it without yeah. the understanding of what it would become. Where it would but, go, yeah. Well, know, I don't think anybody knows is that Tracy was actually sort of the start of the inkling of the idea of a YouTube channel. Yeah back in 2018 and then we started a little slack that was called videos I actually just went and found it <laughs> and looked through it and it was the three of us trying to formulate what is now our YouTube channel which was yeah. really fun to go back and look through okay well since you are one of our little YouTube founders we might as well give a more complete introduction to you we should say that you were the first bookends junior agent you okay. came on when we didn't have much of a kid list we were more in just the ya space um so what was that like sort of you know coming to an agency that didn't have the kid lit genres that you were working in um what appealed to you about bookends so i feel like i've always had a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit um and when jessica and i had our first phone call and we talked about all sorts of things um, about, uh, you know, her background building bookends and then where I'd be coming from, right? I had experience in children's lit. I just graduated with an MFA in writing for children and I was really excited to get back into agenting. Um, you know, I'd been at an agency for four years before starting grad school. And so I love the idea that I could join this team and bring something new, my own skill set, um, but at the same time, um, you know, be in an atmosphere that was entrepreneurial minded and really um, was welcoming of exploring different ideas and, you know, where the agency could go in children's and then obviously for me learning from you know agents who have been building their list for much longer than i have so um it just felt like a great match when you were sending out resumes and interviewing and things like that because i'm curious about this because i think a lot of people would say well i want to do kidlet and this agency doesn't do kidlet so i'm not going to apply to them um, and I don't know if it was a matter of, I'm just going to apply to everybody or, <laughs> or if you actually had a sort of thought in mind when you went into it. No, I actually did going into it. Um, you know, I was thinking about how agents usually join agencies and a lot of times you come with a list and I knew that I didn't have a list to come with, um, and that I was overqualified to join as an assistant. Um, so I was like, well, what can I bring and, you know, who would appreciate that? Right. So, uh, no, it was intentional. I like, <laughs> I pitched you me <laughs> <laughs> intentionally. It worked. <laughs> so then what, when you finally did start at bookends, what was it like sort of starting from scratch and really building up that? division which then became bookends junior i think um not too long after you were here right i think it was like a year and a half after you were here where you officially called it bookends junior and did the website redesign and got the fancy new bird yeah um you know it was you know, I, it was starting from scratch, but not starting from scratch, right? I still had um, a lot of my contacts from when I was at an agency previously. And, um, you know, I was familiar and comfortable with reaching out to people. Um, and a lot of times I just say, you know, hey, like, 
it's been a while since we talked. Last time I was working here, I left to join, or I left to earn my MFA, and I've now joined Bookends, and I'm excited to build a list, and here's what I'm looking for. Um, so, you know, I think that I, you know, I wasn't trying to build a Rolodex from scratch in the same way. Um, and then in terms of uh, clients, um, you know, I had an active website while I was an assistant and then through grad school and I was freelance editing and I was doing conferences. I actually um, co-founded a conference back home. So, um, you know, my submissions initially were good. Like I, I again, didn't feel like I was building from scratch. Like I started with a really solid inbox. Um, and I think it's just because I kept my name out there. So even when I was in grad school, you know, I was still kind of talking about children's lit all of the time and working on the conference and I'm curious because Bookends had made a name in adult fiction or adult books, nonfiction and nonfiction. Did you have a hard time finding authors then? I mean, you had your connections with editors, but you know, how did you find authors felt about coming to an agency that didn't yet have um, a kid lit presence or even querying for those who didn't know you? And you know, I think there's this separation between adults and children's that authors don't even realize all the time because we all live in our bubbles. And I think there are a lot of agents that do kid lit that adult authors have never heard of and vice versa. Yeah, um, you know, those questions were definitely asked in some of my calls. Um, and, you know, I was able to just talk about my personal experience. Um, you know, I think it did help that you know, I, I was at an agency prior for four years and then I was freelance editing. And I even talked about how um, I've kind of experimented with publishing myself and how the market has changed. And um, I did a little marketing work uh, while I was a Dean's Fellow. And so I, I think that, you know, I was able to say that like, you know, yes, you'll be among the first picture book clients at bookends, but this is, you know, I've got a decade of picture book experience and, you know, anything that, you know, I can't answer, I will still have a team that can help. Um, so, yeah, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but the That's majority, <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> um, the majority of people I've offered to have said yes. Um, I have only a, a small couple that have passed and went with another agent. Um, and actually, um, there's a few books that I, when I see them pop up, um, it was like one of those like so close to me offering, and I knew that like I knew it would sell. But I maybe wasn't quite the right person, and I'm I'm really happy to see them out there, um, especially when I see they went to someone that I wouldn't have gone to because I'm like, aha, I knew it. I was not the right person. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I think that also right. We're so visible now, right? So you can look on my website and find out a bunch about me and my Twitter. I've been on Twitter since 2007. And, you know, there's, there's enough out there, I think, yeah. from me personally and from bookends that our first bookends junior clients were able to feel comfortable. I was just going to ask, what advice would you give to authors who find themselves with an offer of representation in a similar situation where maybe it's a new agent or an agent representing something that's different from what the agency is known for? I think they should look at the agent's background. Um, but, you know, you definitely, uh, right, like you would not want me to represent, um, if you are an author, your cowboy mystery for <laughs> adults, because I don't read it. And so, you know, the writing might be good, but I wouldn't know that the market is saturated or that particular trope in the market is overdone. So, you know, for authors with 
offers from newer agents or agents that don't have a background in the genre that they're writing, um, ask a lot of questions, right? You know, what are your favorite books to read in this genre? If they can't name a couple within the last year or two, that's a red flag. Um, and then also look at the team behind them, right? Has their agency sold to people that you want to sell to? Mm -hmm. Or are they selling to presses that you're not interested in? In which case, you know, you have to wonder if they have the contacts to get you where you want to go. Yeah. Um, and I was going to say, too, we talked about this a bit in my video, just how, like, expansive your picture book knowledge is, too. So you're able to, when you get on a call, bring that to the call. Like, even if you don't have the list, like when you started that bookends, you didn't have the full list behind your back. You had a level of authority on picture books themselves and you were able to talk about them and vision and stuff like that. And that's something to really look for on the call. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I think editorial, the kind of, I mean, an agent on a call will not give you the full range of editorial feedback that they might have on the book, but listen to what they're saying because that also I think shows knowledge and expertise what they're saying about the book in terms of their editorial guidance that they might be giving. Yeah. Definitely. So we should talk about that a little bit though because you did get your MFA in children's writing and I am reordering your questions here, sorry. <laughs> but, um, you did get your MFA in children's writing. Um, you have one book on the shelves and one book coming to the shelves. So what's it like sort of navigating the picture book world as both an author and a agent, an agent? I mean, ultimately, I think it makes me a stronger writer and a stronger agent. I think a lot of what I do um, as an agent impacts what I'm thinking about for my own writing. Um, so, you know, like when you know that the market is over full of one particular type of book, obviously as a writer, I'm not going to turn around and write another one. Um, and then when I'm, you know, revising as an author, sometimes I realize that like, oh, like I tend to do this in the book. Oh, and that is what my client is doing in this other book. And so the editorial, I, you know, it's, it's helpful for me to be able to look at projects from both the agent standpoint and the author standpoint, and then bring that eye to the other one. And I think it also helps um, just in my author relationships as well, because you know, occasionally as an agent, we have to share bad news. And a lot of times I can say like, I know, like I know what this feels like. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's been a benefit to me. Um, I think even on the marketing side, you know, sometimes when I see things my clients are doing, I'm like, oh, that is so clever. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> right? Or sometimes, um, you know, a client might say like, well, what was your experience with this? And I'll say like, well, I put in this much time and I don't know that it really paid off. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's helpful too. Okay, so fast forward sort of from starting at bookends and building your list. And now you are representing a wide range of project, projects in picture books, middle grade, and even illustrators. Um, so what are some of the things that you gravitate towards in fiction? We should start there. And so you could tell us a little bit about your list. So in fiction, I tend to go for things that are, um, clever and offbeat. Um, so one of those would be Ronan the Librarian. Um, so I love the pop culture reference. Um, and so I, I now actually represent the authors and the illustrator, um, so I love Victoria's sense of whimsy in the project. Yeah. You know, I feel like the art brings a lot to it. Now, was that a situation where Victoria was unagented and you went in later? Because you said, I now represent the illustrator. Yeah, so um, I was introduced to Victoria when she was attached to Ronan the Librarian. Um, and I reached out to her and... Um, we actually went back and forth for about a year um, because she was working on other projects. And, um, you know, it's actually not uncommon for me if I reach out and cold call someone 
um, you know, there's some back and forth, there's some thinking, and then um, there's their answer. But yeah, so, uh, and I think part of that is that, you know, if you're not actively looking, then sometimes when these things just come at you, you know, you, you, I think it's smart to take a step back and figure out um, and just have those conversations. Uh, because presumably when you're querying, you've already researched the person that you're querying. Right. So, um, so back to my fiction taste, quirky, um, subversive, clever. Um, I represent Yvonne Ivinson. She's an author, illustrator, and I just love her characters. And yeah. what I really love about Fox in the Box is the playing with language. And she does this in the follow-up too. The Missing Pairs is coming out in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so good at this. I should just pitch all the time like this. <laughs> Wouldn't this be fun if we, instead of actually emailing pitches, we sent video pitches of ourselves talking oh, about the authors in their books? <laughs> Mine would be a whole lot of stuttering. It would be a mess. <laughs> yeah, everything would be wonderful. Because it's true. <laughs> everything and oh wonderful. my god, I love this book. Let me read you a few passages. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You'd be like, oh god, it's Tracy's story time again. <laughs> So Yvonne is an author illustrator, right? Yes. And bookends did not, um, Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong, bookends didn't represent illustrators before Tracy came to bookends. No, right? not at all. We didn't so, have any, we didn't represent any children's books, so. Yeah. So what, um, what goes into that? <laughs> like it's such, I mean, I know the answer, but I'm asking you to tell our channel, like what, <laughs> um, what, where does it start? So um, in terms, uh, where does it start in, like, well, because I know for a fact, well, I've learned that a lot of the illustrators bookends represent are people that you guys found. They didn't necessarily all, I mean, sure some did, come through sort of the same channels that an author comes through. A lot of them are people that you guys discovered and like you said, approached and they thought about it and maybe weren't looking. And is that one of the, I guess, more common ways to find illustrators? I would say um, maybe a third of my illustrators have come from me reaching out. Um, and I do a lot of browsing on Instagram when I'm looking to add a new illustrator to my list. Um, Which is a good note for illustrators. Get your Instagram account and make it um, update it regularly, like every couple of days. And hashtags, put the hashtags yes. in the captions and your comments. That's because we search kid lit art and things like that. That's how we're finding you. Would you recommend that they, you know, if they are interested in bookends, that they tag you? Or do you, would you rather not be tagged in an illustrator's art? Um, I would not tag me. Um, I would just send a query when I'm open because then you know I'm going to see it. Whereas, right. um, you know, to be honest, if I'm really busy with client work, I'm not going to be on Twitter and Instagram as much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I think I would say the other two thirds of my clients came either through the query box. Um, so Cinema Rabian is someone who queried me um, and her two books are coming out from Simon and Schuster. Um, and then conferences. So Yvonne actually was a conference. Oh. Um, I got Fox that in the Box. Like 2019. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so old school. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it was 2016 or 2017 when, you know, I sat across from her and we were going over her dummy for Fox in the Box. And um, I gave revision notes and I said, I would love to see the revision. Um, and I was really happy when she came back with it. Um, and then we, we sold it in a three book deal. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't really have an end. That was a really <laughs> fun one because I remember when it came in and we discussed it a lot in the meeting. We yeah, all I was looked, say that. yeah, we all looked at it. 
and we discussed it and we had opinions and it was for me from my memory it was my first involvement with an author illustrated picture book and I don't represent them to this day but um, you know because at bookends we share things a lot and get opinions from others and I think it's sometimes good to get opinions from people maybe a little you know who don't represent what we're doing um, but it was really a fun brainstorming and for me to see how it works and how an author illustrated project works for a pitch and and also the amount of work that can go into it because with an author illustrated project when you ask for revisions they're not just rewriting a few words they're redrawing pictures yeah it's like completely re yeah. reimagining what you've got on the page there so far yeah. that's yeah. crazy well, and one of the amazing things about Fox in the Box, so a lot of my illustrators work digitally, um, but Yvonne still works analog. So these are all painted. Yeah. Um, and so when they decided to change the color of the blue sky, they just wanted to increase the tone a little bit. It wasn't going in InDesign or Photoshop. She was repainting the backgrounds um, for 32 pages. So... That's yeah. something else. <laughs> but when you're evaluating illustrators or even dummies, picture book dummies, which are the um, sort of rougher sketches of a picture book, um, what are you looking for? Because there are some things that you look for in the illustration, right? Yeah. So illustration, um, you know, I'm looking for color palette. Um, you know, do the colors complement each other? I'm looking at your figures. Are they expressive? Are your hands and faces? Um, do they look good? Do they look accurate? Um, yeah. Hands are the big one because hands, hands are really tough. Yeah. yeah, that's something you taught me. I always, when whenever anyone at Bookends wants someone to look at illustrator's work, I always look at the hands first because I learned that from you. Yeah, and that's what art directors are looking at first because, and you know, I, I did painting in college and I can tell you that in my unfinished work, it's the face and the hands that are unfinished. <laughs> They're the hardest. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm also looking at um, structure. So if you are, if you watching this are, um, an illustrator or author illustrator, two books that I'd really recommend. Um, so Molly Bang's Picture This, How Pictures Work. Um, and it talks a bit about colors and shapes. Um, and it, it's really, it makes you think about the shapes in your art um, and what those shapes do to us or do to the reader. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other one would be Writing with Pictures um, by Yuri Shilovitz. And, and this is like the whole Kate and Caboodle, right? You know, like how you're gonna lay out your spreads, um, kind of where you want the eye to be looking. So, you know, that's another thing too when you're doing your dummies is your, your cover and your interior art have two different goals. So you want a poster quality is what they call it to your cover art. You know, so it, it is what it sounds like, right? Like when you look at a movie poster and you think like, I want to see that film. So we're doing the same thing here and you'll notice, you know, we're breaking the fourth wall. So she's looking directly at the reader. Ronan's looking directly at the reader. And then he's given a little look up to Ronan, right? <laughs> um, but then in the interior, you want your eyes to go different places. So, there's a reason that the boat is facing this way, right? We're going towards the page turn. Right. And your eye is following all of these characters, right? towards that turn. I don't wanna go through an entire book with y'all. I know <laughs> nobody has time for that. Yeah, but that's really, I think that's really useful. And also, even if you're not an illustrator, I think understanding that can help everybody. You know? Yeah, I mean, especially when writer, we're writing. Right, because a lot of those things aren't that much different for the writer. Like you wanna lead them to wanna turn the page, you know, you wanna create that 
big moment that makes people stop. Like it, it kind of all blends together, really. All right. So the last thing I want to mention um, that I think authors and illustrators should think about, and that author illustrators especially get to play a lot with, is the juxtaposition between the art and the text. And one of the things that I love about author illustrators and humor is that you can play with that juxtaposition and get that humor into the book. So this is Charlene's, Charlene Schwa's Hugs. Love this book. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> um, I saw this, uh, we sent it out as a thumbnail, um, just like wow. a series of thumbnails, because I'm like, this is brilliant. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's about a girl who gives hugs because she's asked until she realizes that she needs that space for herself. So I felt like works on multiple layers, but back to the humor and juxtaposition. So in this spread, right, we have bear hug. And then of course, it is not the like big cuddly bear hug that you think of when you think of like a nice bear hug. It's right. like, ah! Um, and then another um, illustrator that's really good at that is John Clausen, right? The hat series, oh, yeah. that's all juxtaposition of art and text. Um, so, you know, I would think about it as an author, right? Leaving those opportunities for the illustrator to play. And right. then as an illustrator, um, you know, the same, right? Think about those opportunities to, to play with the juxtaposition of the two. Yeah, definitely. Um, and just, um, just to talk about it a little more too, because when an illustrator is crafting their portfolio, there are certain things that we're looking for as well. So we're looking for images of the hands and the faces and all that, but we're also looking for, you know, the bright color text, I mean, the bright color illustrations and also some black and white illustrations. You want to have a full um, portfolio on your website or however you're sending it out. Like you want to have the landscape and you want to have backgrounds, but you also want to have characters and animals too. Yeah, and you want to be able to see scenes, right? So right. your art director wants to be able to picture your art carrying through a 32-page book. And so, um, you know, you want to make sure it's not just like, here's a duck smiling, here's a duck uh, frowning, here's a duck um, waddling, right? We need, like... Ducks. <laughs> <laughs> I, how could I not, right? Um, but we need a story in that image even if the story is just like, oh no, the duck lost their picnic basket in the tree right. and the squirrel's up there eating it. That'd be cute. Yeah, your portfolio, you want your, any image in your portfolio to sort of evoke a feeling, a story that we can picture being carried across a book or that you can carry a story across a book with other illustrations and characters. How long before Tracy gets a submission with a duck, in, with a duck losing its picnic basket in a tree? I don't I'm think here for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that brings us to our last question. Like, what's with the ducks? What's Help us out duck? here. <laughs> our channel knows that I love chickens, but you you got the other end of the spectrum there. Yeah. So I can't I can't tell you why it started. Um, but ducks just <laughs> they make me happy, right? Like, <laughs> can't look at a duckling and not be like, oh. But also, um, I know a lot of cool facts about ducks. So mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, ducks can fly at 55 miles per hour, which is super fast. Um, and then also they're great guard dogs. So a, a mm -hmm. duck, once they've you know imprinted on a family, they will protect you and they actually can break a man's arm with their wing. So wow. yeah, like, Serious guard. <laughs> Not a picture book, though. No. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> though, if you could work it in there, I'd be interested in seeing it. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we had a duck run in at bookends, and I don't know if you guys remember this day, but it was. Oh, I remember. We have to tell. No one story. can forget. It was horrifying. You almost was... killed a whole family of ducks. <laughs> There was a duck family right outside the office, and I went to go get a picture for Tracy, and I, in turn, drove a wedge in between this poor duck family, and the mom left the ducklings, and the ducklings went the other way. I believe the mom went at 55 miles an hour. She did. <laughs> and, it went, and the ducklings went towards the street, and then the mom was on the other side, and she was 
just making sounds, and I was gutted. I asked to leave early and everything. I, I felt, and Tracy was in my DMs like, what have you done? <laughs> what have you no, done? <laughs> but and there was not even a decent picture. That was the other thing. You didn't even get a picture out of it. It was, te- it was really terrible. There were maybe like five or six ducklings, and it was in the line. It was adorable. Like, I was really trying to get you a nice picture, but I just, I, I ruined everything. It was not a good moment. No, I still have like bad flashbacks to that and just feel grief. <laughs> but I hope they found each other. So that's what the mother duck was doing though when she was uh, like moving away and calling. That's what they do. So if they feel threatened and you know, like obviously they can't just like pick up their ducklings and like hightail it out of there. Um, but they go to a safe place and call until the ducklings come back to them. Well, so I like to think know. that they're I'm together. I'm sure they all got back to each other well good because that was that also oddly enough spurred a picture book idea between me and tracy it was true yeah and we wrote a picture book so there you go (laughs) (laughs) not all badness came out of that day i'm sure no badness at the end of it came out i'm just going to be uber optimistic that everybody ended up in a safe spot Good. Just my severe emotional unrest. and Well, just- that's your own fault. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Tracy knows a lot about ducks, and if you have a duck picture book, definitely keep her in mind for it. She'd love to see it. <laughs> um, but I think that's all of my questions for you. Jessica, do you have any last questions for Tracy? Nope. I think it went fantastically. <laughs> well, thank you for watching. Tracy, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions about illustrations or anything that we talked about in the video, put it in the comments. We'll make sure to get you an answer. Um, and thanks for watching.